Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, and thank you for coming after lunch. And I appreciate it if you would wait to take your afternoon nap until after this. Uh, so we're going to be talking about continuous integration and OpenStack. Uh, and whether it's possible, whether we, sh we should be doing it, what is holding us back from doing it. Um, and I'm really going to come at it from both a OpenStack contributor's standpoint, uh, as well as a, uh, a Rackspace uh, employee and uh, deployer of our public cloud. Um, so first off, I guess, who, who, who am I and, and why should you listen to me? Uh, Probably you shouldn't, but the second part is, um, or the first part is, is um, my name is Brian Lamar. Uh, I am a, um, I work for public cloud deployments uh, at Rackspace, uh, and I have been doing that for the last about about a year. Um, what exactly that means is a, a little bit interesting, but um, I'm also an OpenStack contributor since about uh, February of 2011, uh, approximately. Um, I work in a lot of Ansible, uh, Puppet, and Python. And uh, so I, I have a team of about um, four or five guys that, um, people, who uh, all, all work on our public cloud deployments and, and, uh, and work in all those technologies. Ansible, Puppet, and Python are our primary uh, technologies. So. Uh, what is continuous integration? And so a lot of people might know the answer to this, and I'm not uh, an exact expert on continuous integration, but I'm going to try. Um, and I, I want to kind of explain how, how that relates to OpenStack. So what we're not going to be talking about is uh, our, our the continuous delivery, continuous deployment kind of um, aspects of the, what you, a lot of times you hear CI, CD, continuous integration, uh, continuous deployment. Um, there are a lot of uh, people who uh, contest all of these, uh, from anything from what continuous means. Um, some people call it continual. Um, and uh, delivery deployment, what that means. But we're not going to go into that really right now. We're just going to kind of focus on, on, on the continuous integration and what that means. Um, to step back even one more time, though, why, what are the benefits of, of continuous integration? Um, and why are we looking at doing that? Uh, the first one is really that OpenStack, I want OpenStack to always work. I know that we have, we have releases, we have um, milestones, and we have this whole release process, but uh, my goal is, especially the goal of Rackspace, is to kind of deploy OpenStack at any point in time, not just when the, you know, the release comes and we have all these bug fixes. And um, we really want uh, the, the release to be, I mean, yeah, open stack should always work. That's just it's that's that's what to put it. It, it really and, it, and and since it always works, it does allow for 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 more frequent deployments. So here's a big long list of um, basically it's just a couple topics and practices of continuous integration. Um, I stole this blatantly from Martin Fowler's website. Um, he. I would recommend you guys reading the link um, right there, um, or just reading anything um, um, that Martin Fowler has, has to say in, within reason. So I'm going to go through these topics uh, one by one really quickly, kind of explain um, what OpenStack is doing right now, which kind of works with the process of um, continuous integration, and, and what it might be able to do to kind of uh, speed that along. So the first, the first uh, subtitle there is maintaining a single source repository. Um, and this kind of might not be exactly what it seems. Um, basically, the, the, the point of this is to say, use source control. Uh, and a lot of times, actually, when, when Martin Fowler wrote this, it was, I mean, I know that I worked for a company about 10 years ago that we worked on software and we didn't use um, source control. We didn't use, I mean, our deployments were literally copying a file. and, and and running uh, a make uh, on a Visual Studio box in production. Um, and so really, you should be using source control. Um, you should be using um, tools to, to minimize the amount of branches that you have to control um, in, in, those, in those source controls. And so 
basically, this is covered by, by our use of our, our really big toll thing with uh, Zool and Jenkins and review.openstack.org. Um, and so one of the, one of the things that, that kind of bugs me, and I'll kind of, I'll say this and then I'll explain what I mean by, by constant interoperability between projects is, is, a, is an issue with this. Um, a, a while ago, we broke out Nova into, um, well, Glance was kind of in Nova and then Glance became, became a, a separate project and um, we made the decision to have many different repositories in, in OpenStack. So OpenStack as a project is a bunch of like sub projects. So you end up with not always having all of the tests run successfully uh, against uh, every, every, every master of every project. So I'll give you an example. Um, whenever someone creates a new Nova commit, uh, we have to install dependencies uh, from pip to run the, to run the unit tests. Um, and it doesn't really matter you know, where they come from. In this case, it's um, pip, but we install a bunch of dependencies, and those are examples of the dependencies, um, PBR, SQL Alchemy. Uh, and the last one is Python Keystone Client. So actually, one project, one OpenStack project, which is Nova, relies on another OpenStack project, which is Python Keystone Client. Um, and the issue is that when we install that, we actually install the version that was cut whoever, know, who, who knows how long ago, uh, and put into this repository, this package repository somewhere. And basically, what this, what this says is that the latest Nova doesn't actually work with the latest Keystone client. The latest Nova works with the latest pip package Keystone client. Um, and so it's, it's, it makes it a really difficult to um, say, oh, I want to get a new feature into Keystone client that Nova needs to use, but I don't know when Keystone client's going to be released to pip, and it just, it's, a, it's something that I would like to, to fix, and I have talked to um, some people, and, and I'm hoping to talk to the right person to, to get, that, get that worked out, but I think it's, an upstream issue, um, which I wouldn't be more than willing to, to help out with. So, um, right, so that should not be from Git, or should, should be from BIP, from Git and not PIP. So the next uh, tenant of, of contingency integration is automating the build. Um, and basically this um, is done by DevStack, and it's, it's, it's great, it really works. Um, we have third-party voting bots, um, which basically um, allow other companies to, um, to vote on changes uh, on, that are coming downstream. Um, and it really, it, we're very successfully automating the, the build of OpenStack, in my opinion. Um, so making your build self-testing, basically this means you should have tests, and we do have tests. We have unit integration tests, we have um, the Tempest test suite, um, but there isn't, we don't really have any hard requirements on actually including tests. Um, this has been a big thing we've been talking about over the years, and um, some people want to say, oh, you know, the test percentage uh, should never go down when you in, include a, a, a change. Um, it's, it's something that we've been debating back and forth, and I, I think that it hurts the, the continuous integration ability of, of OpenStack, but um, it is also understandable that certain changes um, subjectively um, and objectively cannot have or should not have tests. Um, so this is a big point that, that Martin Fowler makes about continuous integration and that people should be committing to mainline every day, um, which basically isn't really able to be enforced because I, I'm not your boss, um, probably. And so I can't make you, I can't make developers say, um, make, a, make a small change and make sure before you go home that day, you, need, you, know, you have that commit um, at least up for review. So we have all of these, these smaller, smaller reviews, which are very, smaller reviews are, are very easy to be tested. They're very easy to be reviewed. They're less likely to include bugs. Um, However, there's no really consensus of what a small patch is. 
um, and, and what, what does that mean? So it's, it's, it's really a, a subjective thing. Uh, let's see, so every commit should build um, the main line on an integration machine, so uh, this is just saying that we need to, you know, we do this. We do, we do that with what I told, saw, talked about before, which is review.openstack.org and Garrett and Jenkins and, and Zool and NodePool and all of those great things that the uh, infra team has created. Um, keeping the build fast. So uh, this is one we struggled with. Um, project test suites are still slow, in my opinion. Um, it shouldn't take uh, it shouldn't take ten minutes to run unit tests. It shouldn't take it shouldn't take. I mean, sometimes it takes half an hour. Um, with us for Neutron, when we first started, Neutron was taking two hours and required over four gigs of memory to run tests. Um, it's it's not. It's not fast. Um, but on the other hand, with such a large project, I I'm really not convinced that this actually matters. Um, test reviews need to be up for at least eight hours, preferably probably a day, so that everybody can have a, a few hours in their time zone to review patches. And so it's not, we're not going to be a fast moving project in, in, in terms of typical software development where it's in house. Uh, so I don't think that it's. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that this actually really matters. Um, so test in a clone of a production environment. You really want your project to be, to be built as close to production in your pre-production and your pre-pre-production environments so that when you do put your code into the production environment, you know it's going to be you know, run successfully and it's going gonna, it's gonna to run without issues. Um, this includes integrating with things like your in-house billing system or your in-house um, authentication system or, or whatever. Um, and so this is really handled by our, the, the third-party kind of bots that I, I kind of alluded to or talked about earlier in that um, we're actually really, really getting good at allowing companies to say, this is, the, this is the deployment that I have for OpenStack. I'm going to, you know, on each commit upstream, I'm going to take that commit, I'm going to do whatever I need with it, and deploy it to my environment, and then I'm going to vote on that change to see if it worked or not um, after running some of my tests or some of the upstream Tempest tests or, or whatever. Um, and so it's, it's really not up to the OpenStack infrastructure guys. They, they are allowing us to say, you know, this is what my environment needs to look like, um, and, and, and Make, it, make us really put, put the onus on us. Um, make it easy for anyone to get the latest executable. This is somewhere that I think OpenStack really can improve on. Um, and the word executable is kind of a, an interesting word to use, but um, when, when Martin Fowler describes what a project is, he actually kind of um, says that there's the code and the configuration and everything should be kind of in, this, in the repository so that when you do a deploy, it's, it's really just one command. You either double click something or you run a, a simple command and you say deploy. Um, we don't have any sort of configuration or any sort of deploy scripts in OpenStack and, and there's no real executable in Python. And so uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, it, and there aren't any upstream packages. Um, they just don't exist. Uh, as, far as, I'm, as far as I know, I could be completely wrong on this. Um, each commit doesn't generate anything, um, any Debian's anywhere or any tarballs anywhere um, that you can easily, easily consume. Um, and, and that's actually not true because there are, there are some, uh, like Python Glance client, Python Keystone client, all the, the clients um, are actually on PyPy as I kind of talked about earlier, because they're actually used in the build of all the other projects. But uh, there's not a consistent release in my, I mean, I don't know when Keystone client gets updated and when Glance client gets updated. Uh, it's, it's not consistent. And so I, I'd like to either have that and have it consistent or, or not have it at all, really. Uh, so everyone can see what's happening. It's really important in continuous integration to say, you know, a developer knows what's happening with this change. A, a product manager knows what's happening with this change. Um, we have a great gate. I, I really like it. Um, we have the ability to have third-party um, input. We have 
a, a lot of great things that they provided for us. Um, I was just in a, um, a session earlier, yesterday I think, or the day before, where we described, um, or where, where the infrastructure team described what a third party bot was and what the requirements were for, um, for having that and kind of making that really easy for people to, to have. Uh, one of the things that is happening, though, is that there is a large amount of information overload um, with Neutron or some of the projects that have, uh, I don't know, 60 bots or whatever, um, and they're all commenting on this one review, and then, and then someone makes a patch set, and then they all comment again, and then it's, it can really be, I think we're working on that with um, projects like, uh, is it Vins? Um, and, and different, different, different things um, that can really help the, the workflow and the visibility of where my change is and, and, and what do I need to do to get it in. Uh, so the next one is automating deployment. And there is no official deployment method, really, of, of deploying OpenStack. Um, with continuous integration, it's important to deploy. However, it kind of blurs the line between continuous integration and continuous deployment or continuous delivery in that it is a deployment, yeah, yeah, what is a deployment? And actually, that's a, a great question. Um, I, no idea. Not, well, not only were we, never, were we never ever able to define what is a deployment in the OpenStack community, um, but it's actually, it's difficult to, to agree on what tools you would use and, and what a deployment is. And, and not only that, it wouldn't really be useful to, to companies because the deployment that the upstream people would you know, agree on wouldn't actually be the same deployment um, as, as we might use. So that's really why we've left the automated deployment party uh, back to the, you know, the deploy bots who can deploy in your environment. You can have your own custom deploy, and then you can comment on commits uh, upstream to say uh, whether or not that, you know, that commit works for, for your environment. Um, so, so what is Rackspace doing now? And we're doing daily, daily pulls of upstream code. We're pulling them down, and we're merging our, our custom code repository uh, into the upstream code. And we're using an uh, open source software called PlyPatch, which is written in-house by uh, Rick Harris. And it's, it, it, it does work. Um, it means that we're, we're carrying a lot of custom code, a lot of custom patches, um, which I'll show you later might not be that good. Um, with, those, with that code plus our custom patches, we build a custom virtual environment. We run unit tests. We build a tarball package. We deploy that tarball package. We run more tests. We kind of do a promotion process from from one of our continuous integration environments into our pre-production environment. We run more tests. Um, and then we have you know, staggered production deployments over all of our, all of our production regions. Um, and that's, I mean, that sounds simple, right? And so that's actually one of the, um, one of the kind of flow charts and, and how everything works. And there's, there's a whole process for what happens when the code upstream merges with our patches that conflicts and we have to, meh. Uh, so overall, largely, um, you know, it's a really simple process. Really simple. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's because of this, this, this unnecessary complexity of us um, holding our own patches that is really making things the most complicated. Um, and so it's taking us about 21 days to choose a release branch, um, meaning that you know once we we bring down OpenStack that day, we start our 21-day process and we start you know looking at what code bugs that our code has introduced versus what upstream might have introduced that they didn't catch because we're using some sort of weird configuration variable that you know they didn't they didn't test or, or we didn't consider to test for. Um, and then after that, it takes about 45 days for us to you know, deploy everywhere and then start looking at the, the OpenStack code again. So by the time we actually start looking at the OpenStack code again, it's been, we're about eight weeks behind. And 
then we start the whole process over again, and that's actually, it just compounds on itself, because we're eight weeks behind, it's not, it's not easy to, to, to really get into it again. Um, and so, here are our patches. We have about 80 patches. We have the most, uh, the green one is actually Nova. Um, we have uh, probably over 40 patches, and uh, on, the, on the right is the, about 35,000 lines of code. It's a lot to maintain. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. And we have a couple of environments that we deploy to. Um, you know, 40,000 things we deploy to. So, it's, it's a lot of code that's overhead. It's a lot of things that, that we're deploying to, and I really want to make this as simple as possible um, because I'm going crazy. And I get, this ask, uh, I get this question asked a lot, so what's taking so long? Um, you know, why can't you just take all of these custom things that we want included with this OpenStack and, and make them into this package that, that gets deployed? Um, I'd say at least 90% of my time is identifying and, and fixing issues with, um, with our code that has been integrated with upstream code, which we've deployed and found issues with either, either before we deploy it in that it doesn't merge correctly or just that after we merge it, there, there are issues that it, um, it introduces. Uh, I work with our Jenkins infrastructure which is, has nothing to do with upstream Jenkins infrastructure. Um, our packaging process is completely separate. Um, our deployment process is, is completely separate from upstream. Um, and then there are tons of integration issues with, with our, our, as I said, you know, our billing systems, the auth systems, the, you know, there's, there's tons of stuff we have to worry about, and just, it takes forever, a long time, um, and, and we can't improve. Uh, I, I promise. And so, uh, the question is how? Um, and the first three, uh, the first three bullet points are actually the same. Um, we need to stop carrying our own patches, um, because, yeah, it, we, we, we contribute, we, we, as a company, Rackspace really, really, really needs to work with the community and not with themselves on their own, on our own, um, our own, you know, patches, and we, we just can't, we can't do it. So, I don't, I don't, we, but besides just, just getting rid of our patches, which is a big thing, I really want to stress that, that is a really big thing, um, I'd like to, to look at doing packaging upstream so that each commit, each commit is deployable by anybody that wants to, to kind of pull that, that, at, point in time, at any point in time, OpenStack should be able to be downloaded um, and, and run successfully. I don't know how, how well this would go over, but um, I'd like to explore different deployment methods upstream, um, maybe creating some sort of um, suggested or, or reference deploy, but I, I know that's really, really, um, it can be controversial. Um, so why do we have custom patches? It speeds development time for us, or we think it does. Um, there's a huge cost to people like, like me and my team because developers will go out and they'll create code and they'll say, oh, well, it doesn't fit in the OpenStack model. It doesn't, they're not gonna really, they're not gonna, they're not gonna put it in, so let's just put it in our own repository. Um, and so at that point we have to say, well, if they're not gonna put it in, there's probably a reason. Um, and so, you know, we need to put it we need to get it in, and they're gonna, it's going to take them a little longer maybe at first to, to do that, but it, it can, can work. Um, we have proprietary features. We don't really have proprietary features, and we shouldn't. If we're going to work with OpenStack, we really shouldn't. Um, there's proprietary integration, things like, um, things like your billing systems and your, any, any sort of off systems, and, and really, we can, we can allow that by doing things like plugins. Um, plugins and configuration options. And so, real quickly, there's a, uh, a nice billing system story, which I, I will try to tell briefly, um, in that, so, people may or may not know that our, 
our uh, Nova um, emits kind of notifications for usage and, and, and billing systems to consume so that we know how much to charge our customers. Um, and we had a, a date string in that notification which our billing system had hard-coded. And then we changed it in op upstream OpenStack. And so one wouldn't think that a billing string was really that difficult to, to change in the billing system once, once they started getting the new string. Um, but we actually carried a custom patch for that for over a year because, because they couldn't change the billing string because it's, you know, billing systems are difficult, evidently. Um, so it's, I understand why people carry custom patches, but wouldn't the answer of that really just be, you know, making sure that OpenStack was flexible in what, what date string it sent, or, and then we could have a configuration option to say, oh, this is the date string we wanted. Um, and so there are different ways of, of doing things other than creating custom patches and creating overhead for other teams. And, and yeah, developer, I, I know, talked to a couple people on the teams, and it's gonna be more difficult to get your code in to OpenStack rather than taking the easy route and putting a custom patch in our custom proprietary repository. You know what, I don't care. It's, I don't care. So going forward, the long story short is um, I want us to stop carrying patches. I, I want us to encourage pluggable code. Um, I, I want to make sure that we're commenting on Garrett with the results of our deploys. Um, I want Rackspace Public Cloud to be, you know, as, as soon as someone makes a commit, we're, we're spinning up a, as, as production-like instance as possible um, and, and making that, that comment to say, oh, you know, that doesn't work with our public cloud and here's why and here's how to fix it and giving that feedback to the developer so that we can all work harder and, and, and better and faster. Uh, for OpenStack, I, I want to talk about the official OpenStack deployments, um, what we can do with packaging, um, just in general project interoperability that I talked about before with making sure that every, the latest version of Nova works with the latest version of all the clients and the latest version of Glance works with the latest version of Nova and everything like that. Um, I really want to st strongly encourage smaller commits and, and make sure reviewers know that, that smaller commits are, are better and they, they, they are, I promise, and I will talk to you about that all, all you want. Um, and definitely keep encouraging tests because it's one of the things that it, it, does, it does make things um, does make things better. So, a couple of fun reads. There are, there are two books, um, Continuous Delivery by Jez Humble, kind of, um, well, Jez Humble and, and David Farley. Uh, Jez is a great guy, I've met him, and I, I really do recommend, if you have a chance, um, to read that book, to, to do that, and um, uh, The Phoenix Project is another good one. It's not necessarily exactly about continuous integration, but it's really about the whole uh, DevOps, IT kind of in, um, integration and, and collaboration. So that's really all I have. Um, it's, uh, yeah, any questions? On the, on the flow chart where you showed kind of your process of doing this, there's a slide before that with kind of bullets, and one of those bullets said, I think, like, build, build custom virtual environments. Is, are you referring to, like, the Python virtual environments for that or, or something yes. else? Yes. Yes, I am. So, so are you actually building a separate virtual environment for every, basically every package then? Or yeah. So else? what we do is um, every, every, um, Every package we create is actually a tarball with a virtual environment in it per project, per OpenStack project. So Nova has a directory, which is, which is in there. Glance has a directory. Uh, Neutron has a directory and everything. And they're each separate virtual environments, which we basically pip install thing, all the dependencies into uh, and, then, and then install into there. So then do you, I mean, do you ultimately turn those into RPMs to actually deploy them? We actually just we actually use um, BitTorrent and we torrent those around to all of our nodes. Um, torrent the tarballs. We torrent the tarballs. Yep. And so then, um, also, what's included in that tarball are all of our puppet manifests. 
Um, so actually we use, we use Ansible to kind of control you know, BitTorrent and pull those down to all of our nodes. Um, Ansible will unpack them. Um, we actually have a, a symlink on all of our servers which points to the current version. Um, change the symlink, run the puppet manifests, um, which kind of restart all of the services and um, and that's really the, the entire deployment process is, tar, is you know, the tarballs and the symlinks and puppet. So then on, on all the, like, <clears throat> on your regular integration tests, are you basically building out sort of dynamically a full OpenStack install kind of using that same deploy process? Or? Yeah, and so, I'm, I mean, we have um, cloud on cloud, which is we call iNova. Uh, so we have a, a Nova installation, which we can spin up uh, Nova API servers and, and uh, you know, Glance servers and Neutron servers and everything. And so we have Ansible scripts to create those in our, in our under cloud. And then um, uh, Ansible will deploy all the code, configure all of the services, um, and uh, basically kind of build everything from the ground up. The only thing that's difficult with that is, um, are things like hypervisors where we don't have a great way of reinstalling them every time for our continuous integration environment. So um, it's, we do as best, as, uh, best possible effort to clean those up and make those as, as clean and fresh as possible um, so that when we do start over and reconfigure for our, our continuous integration that we, um, yeah, it's best effort kind of thing for that. Thanks. that I want to add, um, I also work on the same team with Brian, is that this is the summit where those of us that are the big operator deployers are finally at the point where we're like, we're all solving the same problem. And so I have already made, we've already made some really amazing contacts with people at DreamHost, at HP, um, some at eBay as well, where we're like, we're all solving that same problem. Even some smaller deployers that are just getting started. Um, I met some great guys from iWeb today at lunch. So if you're interested in helping solve the problem and kind of comparing notes and approaching, please do let us know and join that, join that conversation. Um, it's not gonna happen overnight and we'll probably still be talking about it at the K Summit. <laughs> but just, just do know that we're, we will solve it, but more people would be helpful. <laughs> Any other questions? One of the other questions I think that maybe somebody hasn't asked is what's in the patches? What, you know, we, we've talked about proprietary integration. Um, we have a lot of networking patches in Nova, which is one of the reasons why we were willing to take on the extreme experiment of deploying Neutron to help alleviate some of that. Um, a lot of that Neutron code is related to the network functionality. Um, and so, I, there isn't anything in the patch except for maybe like that usage hack that nobody really wants um, that couldn't be out in the, in the up open, but in general, it's, it's cause, because of the technical debt of how old, we've, how long we've been doing this and how long we've been trying it. So this isn't proprietary features. This isn't stuff we're, we're, that isn't part of the community. It's just it's technical debt that we've taken on and that we haven't been able to clean up. And now we're saying, taking a stand, clean it up, don't create more. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually a, a great point in that I view these patches really, and anybody that is creating patches, it's, you're basically creating technical debt for yourself and, and don't. I, I really, really suggest do not do that. Um, it's, it's probably not necessary. Um, actually, you know, I know it's not necessary. Yeah. Keep it for your configurations, your facts, your pl custom plugins. Don't try to hack the OpenStack code without yep. being part of the community. It's really not worth it. So we can wrap cool. it up. Yeah, no, that's it. So thanks, guys, for coming. <laughs>